And uh, the classic Dave Alfred pooping whale. We even had stickers made that says, everybody loves a pooping whale. <laughs> and, uh, we're out of now, we have to get more of them. Because it says so much, like if a whale's pooping, that means that it's eating. And that's what we want. We want to have whales that are eating. So uh, we conduct our study from a small 21 foot boat um, and with the use of a scat detection dog, we're able to take this uh, amazing amount of information uh, by way of a fecal sample and we're able to answer questions about all three of the identified threats to these whales and then some. Um, again, this is one of those situations where the more we, uh, the more we ask, the more information we can get. And that list along the side is just uh, showing you some of the other species that the conservation canines dogs are, are trained on. So our dogs come from mostly rescue dogs, so these don't make um, good pets necessarily. They're very high energy, they just want to work. Um, we like to say that when you're um, trying to see whether or not your dog would be a good conservation canine dog is drop their toy in a, in a bowl of steak or something like that and see which one they go for. <laughs> if they go for the food, then they're not going to necessarily make a good conservation canine dog. Conversely, it's hard sometimes to get our dogs to eat because they just want to play all the time. So the little guy down at the bottom, those are Tucker on the side, and then the um, little gentleman on the end there is um, Jack, and he's one of our two dogs that we're um, uh, working with now. So this is my team, Colette, and this is actually Dio, our dog that um, uh, we got to work with quite a bit last summer. He was getting really good. The hard thing about these dogs is, you know, when we were training Tucker, we had whales almost every day. So in 2008, uh, in 2009, in the summertime, we had whales almost every day. <clears throat> so we were able to go out and the dogs got a lot of time with whales. They got to do close loop follows and then we would space the distance out more and then they could do distant loop follows to the point where um, they were doing their job uh, appropriately, which means that we were 400 or 1,000 meters away from the whales. Now it's really hard because our new dogs that are being trained don't have whales every day. In fact, we could go weeks or even months without seeing southern residents, depending on weather and things like that. So it's, it's, a, it's a different world out there for sure. But um, these are phenomenal uh, working partners. And uh, again, I mean, who wouldn't want to work with? Ooh, something bad like that. Yeah. Um, so Susan's question was, um, with the limited amount of time that we have with the dogs now with whales, how are we training the dog? If you actually look really close in this picture, you can see a red bowl in front of us. So we train them by taking a, a sample that we had collected before and we float it out on the water. <clears throat> and then I operate the boat um, a half mile or more away from that, that sample. And then my job is always to orient the vessel um, at a 90 degree angle and downwind of, the, of that sample, or if we've got whales, downwind of the whales. And so we just do transects back and forth along that, um, that 90 degree <coughs> angle so that as the sample, um, as the wind is passing over the sample, the, um, the scent cone opens up and that's what the dog reacts to. So we do a lot more training. We spend a lot more time with bulls, um, which is fine. Um, but it, you know, it's it's not the same as being with whales. The dogs um, we have to swap out samples because they're just they end up not getting bored exactly, but it just becomes too rote for them. And so sometimes if we can swap it out, uh, it'll uh, increase their interest again. So we'll just take a different frozen fecal sample that we had collected. Mm -hmm. So this gives you an idea of, um, and this was actually early data. I really need to make this plot again with our uh, current data. We have um, over 600 samples that we've collected. Not all of those are usable. They're either maybe too small or they've been contaminated in some way, but 600 samples we've collected using the dogs. Um, but I think that Ultimately, what you'd end up seeing is the bar chart for the 400 to 1,000 uh, yards 
and a thousand and, and greater would be even bigger than that. So what this is telling you is that we really can stay really far away from the whales and, um, and collect that biological sample without needing to get near them. So um, usually this is the um, second question that I get. <laughs> is, what does it smell like? Um, and sometimes, if it's the right time of year, I can bring a sample and you can smell it, but um, <laughs> not today. Uh, so this gives you an example. This is actually really healthy feces. This is what we want to see. Um, this is really fatty rich. It's staying together. It's clumped up and big. Um, all, of our, all of our descriptors for the fecal when we're collecting it um, end up being about food, which is a little <laughs> weird, but these we would call pancakes. Um, sometimes we only get a teeny, teeny, tiny bit. Like this. Or like that little white one up there. And yet the dogs can smell it. The dogs can smell that from a half a mile <coughs> or a mile away. Wow. Um, these are fantastic samples. This would yield um, an amazing amount of information. We would be able to share it with our colleagues that do the toxicant work, um, other colleagues that do other sorts of parasite work. Um, sometimes when the sample is just too small, we have to hang on to that in order to just be able to do our analysis. But um, it's not that common to see samples like this anymore. It's um, often the case where we do, I know we're in the right area because my GPS track is literally, I'm going in a crazy eight circle, like around and around and around and around, and the dog keeps hitting in that same spot. And sometimes we can even smell it, but the fecal sample is so watery and so diffuse um, that there's nothing there to collect. And so that's really hard because you've got a dog that's done his job, um, but we can't reward him because we haven't actually been able to scoop and verify. Um, that, that we're on the sample, even though we know we are. So, um, <clears throat> so again, I said that we can get an amazing amount of information. We can answer questions about all three of the main identified threats, and then we're adding things all the all of the time. Yeah. We have a colleague um, that's going to be working with us. Um, we've been collecting um, parasites and worms. I have a picture of one um, later on in the slideshow. Um, and we've been sending those on to Joe Gatos at the Sea Doc Society to do analysis of the worms that we get out of the feces. Um, but evidently, um, there's little cysts and little sheds from other parasites that are in quite a number of our samples. And so we have a grad student and another grad professor that's working with us now to analyze those. So that's going to be really interesting. Um, so nutritional status, of course, that's one of the main identified threats, stress hormones. Um, the first paper that came out of this, um, and just, I know this is a review for a lot of people, but I always find that there's always a few people that don't know about the past studies. So our first study that came out of this was in 2012, Dr. Catherine Ayers, and her study looked at um, stress hormones in relation to nutrition hormones. And so she wanted to know whether or not different densities of vessels change the um, stress hormones in the whales. And it does. So um, interestingly, or probably logically, um, the more food the whales are eating, the less there is a signature for stress related to vessel presence. So yet another um, really clear indication that food is, is very, very important for these animals. Um, uh, toxicant level, so um, this dovetails really nicely with um, Sandra's um, talk just, just recently. Um, it absolutely shows um, where we can look at fe fecal samples um, and get the, a lot of the same information um, and as accurately as we used to have to get um, looking at blubber biopsies. So again, this is a non-invasive way of collecting a biological sample that you can pull data out of um, in a non-invasive way. So these are some of the findings. Um, this is uh, with regard to the uh, PCBs. And this is uh, in relation to the amount of fish that's available. So for all of these different age and sex class um, animals, that's what is represented by the different shapes. <clears throat> for all of them across the board, this is showing you that with more fish, the toxin loads are less. And then for some of them, it makes sense. Like the adult females with greater than one calf, those guys are at the bottom. Those have the least amount of toxins in their system, which makes sense. Some of them that are really surprising um, are 
the adult, well, the adult male is, is not surprising. Um, where's the one that I was looking at earlier? Oh, the juveniles. Look at the, look at the green diamonds. So they're really high. Those, are, those ones are almost as high as the post-reproductive females. And most of our post-reproductive females for the study at this time was for our very, very, very old animals. So animals that hadn't given birth for 30 years or something. So these juveniles are really high up, um, high like those uh, adult females are, which obviously is a very bad thing for uh, our males. We need our males to get big, get old, um, and stay healthy. And um, as was pointed out in the last talk, there's no way for them to offload those toxins. And we're seeing that in the loss of our, um, our males that are just getting to, to reproductive age. I already hinted at this. Um, another really great thing about um, fecal samples is that you can look at toxins uh, in the samples at, without having to do the blubber biopsies. So this means that um, I am a proponent of, of blubber biopsies. I think they're important. Um, uh, that you can't do them all year, whereas for fecal samples, you can collect them all year. And this uh, Jessica Lundin's study showed that you can do a direct comparison between um, global and, uh, and scalp. So um, when we first started looking at the, at the samples, the whales definitely were coming in healthier, um, and if, particularly in years when the Fraser River Chinook runs were low. Their uh, health, their nutritional status would just pretty much tank throughout the summer. Um, last year, we didn't even have the whales in May. So everything, as we all know, is changing with these whales, with their use of the habitat, with their um, access to food. Um, their social dynamics are changing. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're in the process of reanalyzing, or not reanalyzing, analyzing additional samples that we've gotten in the last couple of years. Um, the next two um, bits are um, intuitive and uh, just go along with our last speaker. Um, Sam's study that came, Sam Wasser, the, uh, the lead on this project, his paper uh, about pregnancies came out in July of uh, 2017. And uh, this was shocking. I mean, we knew that a certain number, upwards of 50% of newborn calves don't make it. I don't think anybody knew how many pregnancies were lost before this study came out. This was, this, um, uh, at least to me, was incredibly shocking. So almost 70% of pregnancies, 70% of the time that females get pregnant, they lose the baby before the baby can be born alive. And how long has that been going on? Is that an average? We, we, can, we only have that information from our, our samples, which go back to 2008. So the other thing that came out of this study is that 23% of those losses are in late term. And we know the devastating impacts that that can have on a female like J32, whose baby died in utero, but she couldn't pass it. And if essentially the, the fetus rotted inside of her and killed her from the inside out. Um, the bigger the baby, the later it, it dies, the harder it is going to be for the mom to, to expel it. So this is really um, horrible. We know also that we're having, um, and this goes back to some older studies, um, where you know giving birth is. We think that we think giving birth is just this thing that happens, and it is. But we kind of I think forget about the um, inherent dangers that are involved um, for humans and for for mammals, wild mammals. Um, and I think that we. Um, we are seeing some impacts of pregnancies that have some uh, additional complications. J50 was an example of that animal, probably born breech, had to be midwifed out of her mom. Um, so, and we don't know what's happening uh, with a number of, of females that are getting pregnant and then uh, the calves aren't, aren't living. So why are, what, what's happening? Um, Here's the lovely picture of the two-foot worm that we found. We sent this to Joe. I still haven't gotten the analysis back on what this is. Does anybody know? <laughs> anybody uh, experts on worms? <laughs> worms are not that big of a deal for a healthy animal. They can have a certain um, 
uh, biota in their gut of worms. The problem happens when they, the whales end up being not healthy. The worms become hyperabundant and they can cause problems by burrowing through the intestinal walls and into and um, you know messing with other internal organs and causing secondary infections. And um, so it is really important for us to be able to get a handle on what, what's a normal load for a quasi-healthy whale and then what does it look like when, uh, when they have a, a, an overabundant um, amount of worms? Pardon? Was that found in the poop? Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, she says, yeah, was that found in the poop? Yeah, we just, uh, there was a really nice fecal sample and then this was just kind of mixed in with it. Mm -hmm. So the story that I related to you was actually um, given to me by Jeff Foster, who's in the audience, so he might be able to answer that, but um, as I understand it, de deworming these animals actually has pretty quick um, positive impacts. You deworm them and they essentially um, offload that, the worms die and they poop them out. What was the story of the five gallon bucket? Was that a... Yeah, so so then the second, oh, so he said that uh, those were in captive animal situation and they dewormed it and uh, there was a huge, huge um, amount of, of worms in that, in the well system. That's actually a really great thing though, because if you can deworm them and it, it works that quickly, you could actually see some positive impacts pretty quickly. Um, particularly in a situation where if you couple that with, um, you know, a targeted uh, antibiotic, broad spectrum, long lasting antibiotic, that would be a possibility where you could treat an animal in the wild pretty effectively if, if all the bits and pieces fell into place as far as knowing if it had an infection, what that might be, what kind of antibiotic to target. And that's where we have experts like Casey McLean in the audience and Jeff and Katie Foster and Stephanie Norman, who um, I don't see your face, but she's um, on our on our calls. So one of the other things that Jessica Lindine, one of the grad students who's now a PhD and working for NOAA, one of the things that kind of fell out of her data, she wasn't um, technically looking for this when she started her work, but she wanted to get a baseline for um, the amount of um, different chemicals that are present in the whales kind of at a baseline. Um, it's unfortunate that we didn't have that on the, um, on the Alaskan whales that ended up um, finding themselves completely surrounded by the Exxon Valdez spill, which you can see here was just an incredible environmental um, travesty. Um, of course, we probably, most of you know, we're, we're losing natural lines to that, to this spill. <clears throat> Jessica ended up finding that, um, oh well back to that, um, why she started looking at the fecal samples for PAH um, was because uh, after the fact, um, it, was, it was determined that reproductive abnormalities uh, in the uh, Southeast Alaskan whales, also immune system impairments, population declines, um, all of these things ended up being a byproduct of that spill, those whales um, living through and living after that, that Exxon Valdez spill. So in our region, um, we're just slated right now to double or triple or quadruple the amount of uh, natural gas and raw materials that are exiting our system. And so the potential for an oil spill is, is increasing all of the time. Um, I'm going to get a little bit into how we can all get involved in that towards the end of the talk, but um, this is something to really stay up on. Um, educate yourself about this issue. Um, it would have catastrophic impacts for this population of whales if we had a spill. Um, and, yeah. So, um, what she ended up showing, I'm just going to skip to this slide. What she ended up showing, and it was a few samples, it wasn't a huge um, uh, um, number of samples that she ended up analyzing, but the few that ended up being really significant, I think there were four samples, it was an N of four,
But that top one in 2010, you can really see that PAH, which essentially is an easy way to think about it, is it's the smog that's put out by your boat. Mm -hmm. So that um, that stink that comes out of the back of a, of a, of a, of a motor. Um, it is not something that is long. Uh, it's not a persistent um, toxicant with the whales, but you can definitely see the signature of it. And this was actually really interesting because as soon as the distance was doubled, um, by the federal guidelines that increase the distance from 100 to 200 yards, um, that signature completely fell off. We're not finding that in the, in the sample sense. Wow. So basically at 200 yards, boat exhaust is not, is not showing up in the, in the whale species, which is huge. That's like a brilliant applied science um, finding. Yeah, so um, there's, we don't have that data. Interestingly, I actually have that data for um, about eight years of, of um, data that I've collected, but it's not coupled with the samples that we have collected. And it's not necessarily automatic, like what the whale is breathing in right this second. If it poops out right then, it doesn't exactly work like that. But uh, I think the important take-home message is, is that it, the distance does help. Um, and this is fantastic. And at 200 yards, above 200 yards, it's from uh, the perspective of this, this PAH, it may or may not have any additional um, positive impacts. So we um, added transient killer whale ecotype to our research permit in 2018 so that we could hopefully try and collect uh, transient killer whale feces to do comparison studies between them and the fish eaters. Um, the transient killer whales are um, in the same polluted water. They're eating higher on the food chain, so their toxic load uh, should be higher. It is higher. They're um, dealing with the same number of boats and the same amount of noise. Everything is the same except that their food is really abundant. They have a lot of different things to choose from and all of that, uh, all of that prey is abundant. So um, getting a, a transient feces is really high up on our list. I will tell you that it's really hard to find transient feces. You would think that with the amount of food that they're eating, that they would be pooping a lot, but there's something going on there and um, we can have a conversation about that. I always ask my students, what do you think that is? And um, then they tell me why they think this is, and I'm like, good one. Literally, your ideas about why we're not finding transient poop are as good as ours, because we're kind of in the dark. I can tell you that my colleague, Brent Hansen, who works for NOAA, spent 60 hours behind transient <coughs> killer wells before he found the first sample. 60. And then I think it was like another 40 hours before he found the second one. So there's something very different. Like if the, there are days when the Southern residents just don't poop, we call it a non-pooping day. And after three or four hours, we'll just call it. We just know if we haven't gotten a sample in three or maximum we'll go is four hours, we're not gonna get one. It's like probably a feast or famine sort of thing. If they're eating, they're eating a lot enough to poop out what's left. I don't know what to say about the transients. I can tell you that the one I was with Brad when he collected the first one and the sample looked like a hairball. Um, it was about this big and mostly hair. Wow. Stellar sea lion hair, so it was really coarse and red and held together by some goop. Um, I wasn't with him when the second one was collected, so I'm not sure what that one looked like. But we spent a number of days, not that many, um, because this part of our study isn't funded yet. Um, and we didn't, we didn't find a sample. Um, I know that the dogs know what they're supposed to be doing. Um, they're acting the same way. They're definitely vigilant. They're, um, they're on the job, but there's just not a poop to be found. So does anybody have any ideas, Karen? I just wondered, is it just a different density? I mean, the same yeah. And think about, so Aaron's, Aaron's uh, comment was, is it a different density? So these whales eat a lot of different things. So that hairball one made sense that we would find it because hair is kind of light. It's going to float up to the top. 
But you'd think that a harbor of porpoise, which they basically flint, they grab them and then shake their head in a way that basically rips the blubber off them. It leaves the bones and the inner internal organs often. Um, they're eating the fattiest, richest part of the animal. You'd think that there'd be something to poop out, like a fatty fish, like way much, much better than a fatty fish, actually. Mm. But, mm -hmm. Could it be uh, just their digestive system is different? And so the body has a have a lot of energy that they can so possibly that. Mm -hmm. As well as all the seagulls that are around. Yeah, the seagulls actually we use birds as an indicator to go to a site when they certainly when they've just uh, had a foraging event um, and we do use it for southern resident killer whale feces um, the birds definitely uh, we have to get there quickly sometimes um, so far uh, you know we can get to where the birds are pretty quickly and there's if there was something of substance we would find it I would I would speculate that the um, the transients are, are feeding on a lot of pinnipeds that smell in the air. So why would you want to poop your presence near that, poop underwater, poop in mm -hmm. depth, fish don't smell. Yeah. That's my working hypothesis is that they poop it up. Yeah. <laughs> to avoid letting their prey know that they're that they're there and that they any, any more? Because I'm going to write them down and they'll just have <laughs> more things for us to... Yes, I can. Uh, well, if you're eating a diet that's high in fat like that, that does not necessarily translate into um, a fiber. Mm -hmm. Because so that passes through the cell much more readily mm -hmm. than any type of other uh, macro mm -hmm. Um. Yes. <laughs> I think you're absolutely right. Um, from what I understand, captive killer whales, you know, from the different ecotypes, I think, I don't necessarily think it's anything with their, in, you know, their intrinsic, uh, an intrinsic difference, but how they're using their body and how much energy they're expending might be significantly different. Although I will tell you that the southern residents work really hard to find their food, um, just like the, the transients do. One more. My theory would be that if they're transient, it might be kind of hard for them to administrate treatment. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't catch the last part. I, to what? This, it, our protocol is a little bit different because we don't have any samples to train the dog on. It means that we have to stay a little bit closer to the back end of the, of the transients. So we um, want to give it enough time for the fecal sample to occur, float to the top if it's going to, and then we go in. So we're doing what are called distant fluke follows. So these are like two to 300 meters behind the whales, mm -hmm. right behind the whales, as opposed to doing transects across their path. Uh, which is what we do for the when we're able to use the dog. But as soon as we get one or two samples, we'll be good good to go, and we can back off like we do on the other ones. So, um, and we're also adding baleen whales this year, which I'm very excited about. So nobody in the Salish Sea, except maybe Cascadia Research Collective, opportunistically is collecting feces on baleen whales. Um, I'm really excited about this because um, baleen whales are increasing in abundance like crazy in the Salish Sea, especially uh, the humpbacks. Um, minke whales, their population are coming up a little bit, but I think minke whales were never abundant, ne never very abundant. They don't show up in any of the Indian middens. They weren't um, probably, they were certainly probably here, but not in large numbers. Um, and then the gray whales, I added them to the research permit just in case. We don't usually see them up here, or you see them down here, not up there in, in San Juan, um, but in case we ever come across a gray whale and it poops, I definitely want to be allowed to be able to collect it. <laughs> so this is a picture that I love. I <laughs> Hopefully it won't be like that. <laughs> As I understand it, baleen poop is really different than, trans than the killer whale poop in that it, 
can be really big and um, like really big, like this stage and um, a different color and oily and super stinky. Whereas uh, resident poop is just like ever so slightly old fish. It's not bad. It's really not a like. It's not like a blood meal. Um. So uh, yeah, this is a, um, a little graph uh, showing the difference in abundance of uh, humpbacks through time, just through 2015 from Cascadia. <laughs> so um, you know, back to this amazing picture of the Salish Sea and this amazing ecosystem that we get to call home. Um, by collecting feces from these different um, uh, cetaceans, we'll be able to ask more broad ecosystem-based questions. And uh, really, we don't know what the humpbacks are eating. You know, we are getting 10 and 20 group, groups of 10 and 20 that are lunch feeding here. Um, we, uh, it'll be good to know. You know, we're talking about needing to increase forage fish. Um, this is, a, um, I hate to even say it because it's like everybody's got targets on their head now. And I don't want the humpbacks to become a, you know, the next thing that people want to kill. Um, we already did that. I know, we did already do that. Um, this is a bigger question. This is a, this is this is our way to get at the base information in order to hopefully inform policymakers to talk to them and convince them that we need to make ecosystem-based changes to increase the health of the whole region. So, how much time do we have? I can't see from. <laughs> Um, I wanted to talk about the DTAG study. So we, this has been resurrected. Um, this is um, not as controversial as the um, satellite tag, uh, which is the project that uh, had the unfortunate, um, you know, the unfortunate outcome of um, the death of L95. Mm -hmm. Suction cups are non, uh, considered non-invasive. It takes some time to get them on. Um, but once they're on, the researchers can back off and um, take data from a really far distance, like for hundred meters or more. Um, and the amount of information that these tags collect is just unparalleled. Um, this year, uh, starting in 2018, I think we have funding. Uh, this is a study that is actually being funded by the Canadian Department of Fisheries and Oceans and Transport Canada, um, funding our NOAA uh, um, Southwest Fisheries Science Center team to get out there and put suction cups on southern residents. The DFO team is doing suction cups on the northern residents. And the idea is that um, we don't really know what they're doing at night. Um, an old study um, that was uh, from the Cascadia Research Collective and Robin Baird uh, did critter cam work. Were you part of that, Jeff? No? Hmm. Um, so critter, cam, uh, critter cams were, I do believe, funded by National Geographic, and it was an older style of tag, which was really great. It had a, a, a camera on it. They still use critter cams um, in some places, but the critter cam data actually showed that the whales don't eat that much at night. Um, and Robin's hypothesis was that these whales actually do use their eyeballs, at least in the last um, moments of foraging. So pro they're probably using uh, echolocation for the most part to find and maybe even stun their prey. But at the very end, um, his hypothesis was that they're using, they use their eyes to find their fish. And at night, there's just not enough light. And so um, this study, we are attempting um, for the next, this year was the first, or last year, 2018 was the first year. If all goes as planned, there'll be two more three week um, uh, deployments. So September of 2019 and 2020. Um, and our, uh, the difference with this study uh, compared to the DTAG study from before was that we are attempting to place these tags um, closer to nighttime so that the whales wear the tag throughout the nighttime. Um, and the tag is amazing in that it, it captures everything that the whale is doing um, with its body. So dive depth and speed, um, pitch and roll, so how it's moving. Um, but most importantly for this study is the acoustics. So what is the noise that the whales are experiencing at night? Um, and part of the idea would be if they are not foraging at night, and we know that foraging bouts are so important, and we know that large ships can make noise, one large ship can make enough noise, 
If you can see a large ship on the horizon, it's loud enough to block the whale's ability to echolocate and find food. Wow. So if that is the case, they are, that they are not foraging at night, it's possible that some of that shipping traffic could be shifted to nighttime move through the movements through the Salish Sea um, in order to give the whales as much time during the daytime to be able to forage in quieter seas. It, so um, somebody else, our first speaker, had this woman's graphic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just love her. Great. <laughs> she, this is a grad, I think she's probably graduated now, but when she made our graphics, she was a grad student at uh, the University of Washington, and she um, lives in two worlds. She's a graphic designer and she's a scientist, and she's really interested in, in making things that convey messages to a broad uh, view, viewing audience. And so this is a this is a graphical, a cartoon um, series of, of our DTAG study. And uh, so this is uh, my colleague Jeff Hogan on the front. I was like pointing that out. He likes that. This is actually the all. But he has hair in this one, so he's like, oh, I like that. <laughs> and then that's me in my skirt, and I do wear a skirt on the boat. Um, so I thought that was funny. She didn't know me, but. Um, uh, <coughs> I use a piece, I help develop a piece of equipment. It's a mobile theodolite, which basically allows me to collect a lot of information. Um, I take the latitude and longitude of remote objects, like whales and all the boats around them, and then I can get distances between those two measures. So when we couple the whale collected data, the audio, with the um, observed behavior, and then the distance, we can actually get these snapshots, five minute snapshots through the whales, uh, um, what, the, what the whale is experiencing. Um, and some great studies have come out of that. Um, there's like four studies that have come out of that and I can maybe talk to you guys at the break. This one I love to show because it really shows you how much these whales utilize their habitat. So this is one deployment. Um, this is one dive cycle. This was K33. You can see his depth, uh, dive depth. Wow. And you can see down at the bottom, he was chasing a fish along the bottom of the seafloor. And then the fish shot to the surface and um, uh, the whale followed it. And right when it broke the surface of the water, we were able to go over um, and collect fish bits and oh, fish wow. scales. And uh, it was just, you know, this is just showing, gosh, you know, 600 feet, they're diving that far, that's amazing. Um, and then that little, that little box in the top is the actual dimensions of Tokate or Lolita's tank. That's to scale. So that shows you what she's living in compared to one whale's one dive on one day. Miami Sea Aquarium, off the, off the coast of, um, of San Juan Island. Oh, it's up here. You can see her little body in there. I showed this to the kids from the Lummi Nation yesterday, and oh gosh, just the looks on their faces, like this really, it was, it, they got it. <laughs> And it, I think, hopefully gave them, you know, an understanding of what they're doing, what, you know, that their voices are so important um, in trying to do something for this, this little, this little gal. Have they ever collected from her? Uh, for sure they have, but they won't share it with us, of course. <laughs> We asked for samples uh, from captive killer whales uh, when we were first starting our dog work because, again, we didn't have samples. We didn't even really know what southern resident killer whale poop looked like. And we asked, um, asked for samples at that time, and were, they did not give us any samples. Um, probably they didn't want us running t uh, s uh, stress hormone uh, analysis. Also, just, you know, what are they eating and besides food? Um, I think now they would probably, if asked, they may give samples, but I feel about 50-50 that they would and, and wouldn't. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I, I really feel that SeaWorld has made some positive strides forward. They've got a long way to go. Uh, the, the biggest thing that they could do is get behind the Whale Sanctuary Project's um, uh, attempts to, yeah, to get a, a seaside sanctuary, a permanent home um, uh, for their whales. Um, they, ha they have made some strides, I think, number one, saying that they're not breeding their animals. Of course, there's all kinds of ways to get around that. Um, I think that that's, this is a great example of how public pressure has, has brought about some positive, um, positive change. We need to take that, keep that pressure on there, and then also keep the pressure on our elected politicians to do something about the Salish Sea. So this is something that I'm kind of, I'm excited about. I'm not kind of, I'm very excited about this. So um, I was uh, on, a, on a, a lecture at the Friday Harbor Labs, uh, a satellite campus for the University of Washington. And I get to teach a marine mammals of the Salish Sea class. It's pretty much my dream job for 10 weeks in the spring. Um, and I met this amazing postdoc um, who was working on clingfish bio, uh, biomimetics. And she, um, this was right after J32 had died, and uh, we got to, oh, I'm sorry, right after uh, L95 had died, and uh, we got to talking about um, the importance of the information that those satellite tags collected. Um, I don't have any, um, any slides in this, um, in this presentation, but the amount of information that, that did come out of those, those um, satellite tags, the BARB tags, um, was really important. It was massive amounts of data and it was very important data because it definitely showed where the southern resident's habitat is when they're, off, when they're out in the, you know, not in the Salish Sea. And so that information is able to be used in order to justify um, expanding their critical habitat to the, to the coast of, of um, Oregon and Washington and California. Um, that being said, those are invasive tags. And so um, Petra and I got to brainstorming about what if she could take the, the um, mechanics, the biomechanics of a clingfish and apply it to, um, to, to basically make a, a tag that would, that would use that same sort of technology, if you will, to stick on a killer whale that would stay there for a couple of weeks or even a month without puncturing the skin. It would just kind of move around on the skin. It would feel maybe a little weird on the, on the whale, but it would not be like a puncture. And um, just to give you an idea, this is a dead cling fish stuck on a rock, and it's lifting up that rock. That's how powerful the suction is. She took a piece of killer whale skin and suspended it um, with a with a, a mechanical version of, of a of a cling fish, and it stuck for while she was on vacation. Oh. So the the technology is there by using nature. We can create these um, new engineered pieces of equipment that can help us get information that we desperately want and need in order to help protect the whales, but in a way that's non invasive to them. And so. Um, I'm really excited about uh, moving forward with this project. We have uh, the possibility of a, of a funder that's interested in doing a, a campaign for some seed money to help uh, basically uh, help propel Petra into the next uh, series of R&D to get this up and going. So I'll keep you posted on that. Um, so who can tell me who this is? No, no, that's a, this is a much bigger baby. Anybody else? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's J-17 and J-53. This was a couple of years ago. This was in um, 2016. Um, J-17, of course, is our female that is um, not doing well. She's got uh, the photogrammetry team of um, Dr. Uh, Holly Fernbach from SR3 and John Durbin from Southwest Fishery Science Center and then their colleagues um, did, flew over the Southern Residence in September um, and definitely identified J17 as being one of the uh, animals that was thinner than, than most. Uh, and then in December, she was photographed by a Center for Well Research um, uh, colleague, Mark Sears, down, in, down here, South Sound, um, that definitely showed she had um, pretty severe peanut head. 
Um, she's an incredibly important animal. She's the matriarch of a family of six, including herself. I just cannot, I can barely even stand to think about what would happen to that family if she, um, if she dies. <clears throat> Her daughter, J35, of course, made uh, worldwide headline news um, by carrying her calf around for 17 days. Um, J35 is old enough to become the matriarch of that family, but the, uh, the collective wisdom that is, that is housed within the body and mind of J17 is unparalleled. And so I just really hope that she's finding enough to eat wherever she might be. Um, K25 is another male. This is when um, he was just, uh, his, he was a satellite type whale. You can see the wound mark on his dorsal fin. He has healed from this. Uh, he's got a scar that he'll have for the rest of his life. In September, he was documented also by the photogrammetry team as being thin. Um, the good news with him is, is that he um, uh, last seen in December, he was actually, actually I think he's been seen in January, um, has been identified as um, looking better than he had. And so that's really fantastic. Now this animal is interesting because um, he was the oldest and biggest male in that family, in the K-13 family. So when his mom died at the end of uh, 2017, um, it makes sense that he would go through a period of weight loss because he, if, if everything held true, he was being provisioned pretty regularly by his mom. Um, so when she died, the loss of that extra nutrition was probably, number one, shocking. On top of the loss of his mom, suddenly he's way hungrier than he's probably ever been. Um, the good news is, is that maybe he's found his place in that family um, it, as far as like a, a, a way to be with his sisters and their offspring um, to be able to co cooperatively hunt and share food. Um, that's our hope for sure. Um, he's an amazing animal. He's got this butter knife dorsal fin that you can tell from a mile away. He's just a phenomenal uh, young young animal that is, um, we, we really want his genes in the gene pool. So um, I've got a couple more slides and um, so family bonds. Um, you know, this is a picture taken by um, Jeff Hogan from Killer Well Tales from the land bank or the west side pre preserve on San Juan Island, a fabulous place to go and watch whales from shore. Um, you know, these whales have the entire Salish Sea, or in some cases, the entire ocean to, to swim in. And yet most of the time, they choose to be really close to one another, hang out with each other, cooperatively hunt, share food, socialize, roll around, sleep together. Um, they're just incredible animals and um, yeah, I mean, this, this talk is called WOW. I was going to call my talk Southern Resident Killer Whales. Wow. Because that's how I feel about them. They're just, every, everything about them is just so, so amazing. And we think we know everything there is to know about them, but we don't. And, um, and I think that science tells us a lot. We're learning a lot from science. We're learning a lot from naturalists and people on shore and on boats that are looking at these whales and, and putting their family, their family stories together. Um, and it's really fantastic every year to go back and like recap and what's new and what did we think we knew and that got blown out of the water for whatever reason. So we have these fantastic um, guidebooks from the Center for Whale Research, the ID guides that go back to the first year of the study. This one's from 1996. Um, Cindy was um, uh, nice and, oh, this, this is actually not from 96, sorry, this was, this was my, my guide. Um, I just wanted to show you, um, so this is L112, another really sad story, and I didn't mean to put that in there now that I'm thinking about it, because that's not the story I want to tell. Mainly it's just showing this tight bond between this, this whale and her mom. Um, and the ID guide over there helps us through time to piece everybody together, to say this whale is the mom of that whale, and that's the brother of this whale, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. That goes right to my question. Is, do you think foreseeing the future that the um, fecal samples will be able to show paternity? Mm -hmm. Well, that's funny you should bring that up, Caroline. <laughs> <laughs> She's asking, uh, what more can we learn about paternity? Um, so this is L112 and her mom. 
And uh, Dr. Mike Ford, a researcher from the Southwest, uh, Northwest Fishery Science Center, put out a paper in 2011 where he talked about paternity. And he coupled animals um, with their moms and their potential fathers. And so here we have L112. Her mom was L86, and genetics showed that her dad was L41. We know also from that study that a hugely disproportionate number of offspring were fathered by L41 and J1. Um, like more than half the offspring um, were fathered uh, by these two males. So, if you dig a little deeper into the supplemental information in that paper, again published in 2011, you see these charts like this. And um, a friend and colleague, uh, Michael Weiss, who is a grad student at Exeter University in uh, England, dropped a bomb on Cindy uh, around Christmas time and said, oh, what do you think about J1? I don't know what you're talking about. So here's J1. I heard somebody mention J1 earlier and there was this collective like, oh. <laughs> everybody misses J1. He was an amazing animal. Probably the most photographed killer whale at the time when he died. Um, you can see up there at the top, there's J2 and J1. When the studies were first starting, um, you know, the way that uh, Mike, For uh, Mike um, sorry, uh, John Ford, uh, Mike Big and Ken Balcom started to put these families together. Really, it's amazing how accurate they were based on who was hanging out with whom. You know, back then they didn't have genetics. They just, you know, had this revolutionary way of putting animals together that Mike Big came up with. And uh, lo and behold, these two whales, the two most identifiable whales, the two uh, first identified whales, J1 and then J2, were often slash always seen together. And so you can see up there, there's this kind of dotted line that connects them. And if you could read that, it would say um, assumed relationship. Uh, and then there's some other things. And we assume that um, uh, ultimately J14, that picture that I showed before with J1, the J2 and then J1 and J14 and her offspring, that shows this family line here. And then uh, we have my personal favorite male whale, uh, L57, uh, um, Spock. He died uh, too soon. Uh, we show, we see him down here at the bottom with his mom, L47. And then, um, if you look around uh, a little closely in the supplemental data that Mike Ford had uh, presented, um, you'll see J1 up there. And who's his half-sibling? L57. And who's J1's mom? L45. So genetically, J1 is actually the offspring of the female L45. I literally went, wait, what? When Cindy told me that, I was like, oh, my brain just went crazy. Think about that. Everything we think we know about J1 is different. It's not wrong, it's just different. And I love this. This is science. We wouldn't have this information if it wasn't for uh, people like Mike Ford that can actually do this type of work and pull out this information, do the genetics, and, and couple these things together. This is huge for the inbreeding potential of J-Pod, because if, if J1 is not a J-Pod whale, the number of J-Pod babies that he has sired, it's a lot better for the genetics for J-Pod. Let's just put it that way. And then everything else we thought we knew about that whale. We thought L87 was an anomaly because he's popped all three pods now. You know, he was an L-pod whale, then he was a K-pod whale, and then he was a J-pod whale. If the study started right now, they would put him as a J-pod whale. But how many more of these situations are we going to find the more we dig? And so I just really wanted to leave you with that. Um, I think 
about half or more of you are going to go home and you're going to be like, wow, <laughs> what does that mean? Like, go back through all of your notes. Look at your field notebooks that you've written your stories down in about J1 and the babies that J1 has sired and things like that. And it's just, a, it's mind-blowing. Um, that, And I just love the fact that these guys were half-brothers. <laughs> I know. Biopsy samples, right? Uh, yeah, uh, um, biopsy and fecal for, uh, yeah, just to, to double up. I think for both of them, there's biopsy and fecal. It's in the supplemental data, though. Cindy? Did you want to mention the death of L45? Just because that's really significant as well. Yeah. White years No, just something that we thought was really interesting was, so J1 was with J2 since the 70s when they first started studying them, but his genetic mother, L45, was still alive until 1995. Oh, yeah, yeah. So he yeah. was with her that whole time. Which was, uh, so, yeah, sorry, I actually couldn't hear what you were saying, so then I... Um, so why would that be? Why would this, this adult male move to a new pod if his mother's still alive? One hypothesis we've kind of talked about. Hmm? She could have been a J2. Yeah, J2 could have been a better provisioner. There also just might have been something about, um, you know, um, uh, L45's got these two, you know, her, her he, um, um, L57 was born in 1977. His brother was probably at least 20 by the time he was born. So, you know, where does that provisioning, I don't have the answer, I'm just like throwing this, this is why it's so fascinating to keep looking at them, keep, Keep watching them. Keep taking notes and and uh, and data. Um, yeah, it might have just been that these were two really gregarious males, um, and J1 was like, "Gosh, mom, I'm, you're just not feeding me enough. I think you're liking L57 better, <laughs> or something." Or she would have been like, "Hey, you know, I I can't feed both of you. You're already 20. Go find some other old lady." That's it. <laughs> it's possible. Oh yeah, J1, J1 made babies in all pods, yeah. J1 made babies in all pods. Probably other pods, too. Corporate knowledge is something that we have to You know, I think I think the impacts of the loss of J2 we're we're just now probably starting to see. Um, is there anybody, you guys, Aaron? Are you guys seeing anything in that match line? That's Jones, can you repeat the question? Oh, sorry. Yeah, his um, Don's question was um, about how uh, when J2 died. Are we since J2 has been dead now? Are we seeing any um, behavioral impacts or say physiological uh, strain on? The, the rest of her pod, so basically J14's offspring. Yeah, um, so I didn't move up here in 2015, so I didn't have a lot of, uh, you know, kind of reference, but um, it's definitely something we talk about as far as now that Granny's gone and the travel pattern, but it's really hard to know because it's also kind of when we've been talking about fishing, or uh, fish populations collapse, yeah. so it might be several factors, but we do wonder if it's affecting just how often they are coming into this area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, but just not sure. I think one of the really interesting things that is happening in the southern residents is that it, um, the J16s, um, so we, we always think of the J-pod as being the most resident of the three pods. If you take that same analogy, J16s are the most resident of the J of the of J-pod. J16s are the ones that kind of seem to have um, they're here more often than mo than the other than the other whales. 
For example, not last year when no whales, no southern resident killer whales were in the inland waters in May, the previous year the photogrammetry team was only able to get imagery on the J16s because they were the only ones that were here. That means that there was so little food here that not even all of J-Pod could come here and be here, only the J-16s. Now interestingly, John and Holly gave a talk at the Whale Museum at the end of uh, last year, and um, turns out that uh, the J-16s are the thinnest of the J-Pod animals, which in the past, my guess would be that the inland waters were a very, very abundant food source for J-Pod. J-Pod could move down to South Sound, they could go up to the uh, Canadian Gulf Islands, certainly they could go out the Strait of Juan de Fuca, um, but there was probably a lot of food here, and so J-Pod was like, hey, you guys split, I'll, we'll stay here for the winter. Um, that's not the case now. There's not enough food in the winter time to be keeping, um, or at least there hasn't been. Um, this whole thing with the J's and K's being down in South Sound is unique and new, with them being in the South Sound as much as they are. Um, but So I think that the, the very fabric of this population of whales is changing. And it goes right back to the fact that there's not enough food throughout their entire range. So the whales are having to split up more as a, as a whole clan. So the southern resident killer whale clan, they're not able to come together like they used to. I hear rumor that there was a super pod um, off the coast of Victoria, off the shores of Victoria, after J. Um, L. Uh, 124 was born. That's, that would be the first super pod. And by definition, a super pod is when all members of the southern resident killer whales are together, not some members of all three pods, which that's one of those shifting baseline word problems that I have a big problem with. But evidently there was a super pod, all members were present with the birth of, um, uh, um, not the birth of, but uh, just after um, L124 was, was uh, um, identified. That's huge. That was, I think the one before that, the super pod before that was four years ago. That's crazy. We should be having super pods regularly. They need to be coming together so that K's can mate with L's and J's. And J's can mate with, you know, uh, uh, you know so that we're not having this, these inbred individuals like J16 and J26, mother and son having an offspring. You don't want to have that. You want to have enough food in a region to bring members from lots and lots of different groups together. And so, um, Mike, I talked to Mike uh, Ford, the gentleman that did this paper. I was like, we noticed that you buried that information about J1 in a supplemental document. Are you okay with me bringing this up at a, at a, at a workshop? And he said, oh yeah, that's fine. Uh, we just, you know, was, he thought that it was going to be um, a, like a whole, basically worth another paper kind of thing. Um, what he did say, which was very exciting, is that they have gotten um, the approval and, I, and the funding to do the uh, entire genome of the Southern residents. So he said that uh, after this is done, and he said um, optimistically, by the end of this year, this information will probably be available, at least to the scientists, and then that's going to open up thousands of different combinations of, of, uh, of genetics information that is going to, he just said the amount of information that's gonna come out of that is gonna blow us, blow our socks off too. So that's really exciting. Mm -hmm. We don't. So um, myself and the Fosters, Jeff and Katie Foster, um, and uh, some other folks, SR3 folks, um, are going to be, uh, and now that the gover government's back open for three weeks, I think Brad Hansen's team is going to get out there for three weeks. But our hope is to get, um, get these winter samples, get fecal samples, and hopefully breath samples from all of the southern residents. Um, and hopefully there would be an opportunity to get some from uh, J17 and K25 to be able to look at that. So, oh, you didn't ask about them. You were asking about the pregnant ones. Um, L, um, sorry, K27, uh, so k 25 sister. And then the other one was um, J J41. So she, uh, she's due for another one. She's young. Um, that would be amazing if she had another one. 
Um, at least one of those was heavily pregnant. Um, that was the term that the photogrammetry team used. So I think we're all going like, oh, hopefully she's even, you know, more heavily pregnant. Has We don't know. That's what it, yeah, hopefully they're even more heavily pregnant than they were in September and they haven't lost them. No, I mean in the past. Oh, mm, yes, one. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, so Noah, no, so the question is, is how do you identify the ID of the, of the whale that poop, the sand ball? Um, so that's where the um, blubber biopsies come in handy. Um, essentially, Noah has created a genetics book, um, a pedigree book that we can compare to. So um, all, all living uh, animals after, we don't, they, they um, Brad's team doesn't biopsy them until they're at least a year old, sometimes more like a year and a half old, um, but then that, de that data goes into the, into the genetics book so that we can, you know, cross-reference. And then is there a fear from that lower biopsy of any So far, no. I mean, it's, it's a really fairly um, small amount of tissue that's taken. Um, it can be a little long, but it's basically the size of the end of a, uh, like a number two pencil eraser. Um, and it just, I mean, I guess this would possibly go back to what's happening on the, on the surface layer of the water versus the surface layer of the skin, where it could be a problem, um, possibly. But I can tell you that the, the blubber biopsies have not caused any problems for I would venture to say probably hundreds of thousands of animals around the world. Blubber biopsies are considered fairly um, uh, innocuous, and the amount of information that they can that they yield is uh, tends to, to weigh heavily. Um, one second up there. Mm -hmm. How do we get a breast sample? We get some crazy guy <laughs> named Jeff Foster out on the boat. No, it's it's actually a it's a it's a pretty um, physically demanding thing to do. You have to stand on the front of a boat with a um, like a thirty foot, six meter um, pole, and position the pole over the blowhole as the whale it has has is exhaling. And uh, there's petri dishes that are um, uh, clamped to the pole that are turned over. And so the idea is that the boat driver operates the, the vessel um, parallel to the whale as it's coming up, and then Jeff's out there balancing, and then as soon as it blows, he flips the pole back over and that closes the lids on the petri dishes. And then those get um, right away analyzed for just a huge amount of information. Well, the Two thousand eleven. Yeah, so that's why everybody's like this with K twenty sevens, baby. Mm -hmm. How do the dogs actually tell you when mm -hmm. they spot something? Do they bark? Do no, we did have a barker, um, uh, and it's really irritating. <laughs> it's really irritating. Most of the dogs. Um, so this is this. Oh, it's not um, uh, so essentially when they're on the front of the boat uh, and just kind of standing there as I'm doing my transects back and forth like this across the top the, the dogs are just standing there kind of looking bored in a way probably our board Tucker was so good, he could literally go to sleep on the front of the boat, and if we came across the path of a, of a scent, he would wake up and jump up. Um, I would not trust another dog to go to sleep like we did, like we did Tucker. Um, but essentially, their, their body is very relaxed. Um, they're just standing there, they're looking around, they're kind of looking at their handler, looking back at me. Um, and then as soon as we cross the path where a, 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 a okay, so this is the dog just relaxed. And then if, let's just say I'm driving, I'm driving straight in this case, and there, there's a sample to the right of us. 
Um, and the wind is coming from the right as well. So it's basically bringing, the, the wind is bringing the scent across the sample and then to us. He's just standing like that. As, if, as soon as I cross over the path where this, um, we call it the, the center of the scent cone, where the mo most highly concentrated scent is coming from, he'll whip back and try and come, he'll come back here. He'll run like this, right back here. And then he'll stare at me. <laughs> Sometimes when we were first learning the dogs, they would they we didn't know what they were doing and they were they would go between the windows there, literally to the back of the boat. And so now we know the signs that we're looking for. So as soon as they turn and make their way back the side of the boat, then I know that I've passed past that. And so then I'll turn the boat around. And then it's this series of maneuvers like this, and then they bring it up right alongside the boat. It's amazing. Bonnie? Yeah, so if, um, if Brad has gotten any samples of the, the youngest group, the 2015 gang, mm -hmm. and Ruffles can't possibly be the father of them since he died in 2010, mm -hmm. um, is there any knowledge about who besides L41? Yeah, so Mike, Mike says that he's in the midst of analyzing even more data, so the paternity information that's available is going to blossom as well. Um, so, and I think that we will see some, some variety, thankfully. Mm -hmm. Did you say that you had some information about what we could do to help with the pipelines and the tanker traffic? Yeah, you thank you. So um, there are a number of different groups working. Uh, so the legislative session just started. Um, if you uh, have any inclination whatsoever to get involved in politics, um, I would go to Lobby Day, uh, Environmental Lobby Day, which is on Tuesday. A number of bills are going to drop that day, um, meaning they'll be available for the legislator, legislative um, representatives to, to uh, peruse, ask questions. There'll be some public comment. It can be your chance to, uh, to turn in a written comment or to make a public comment. But that's one way is to get involved with the, with the political system. Educate yourself and you do that through the different groups that are working on the different issues that you're interested in. Anything having to do with the environment, um, making sure that the state is living up to their, the agreements that are already in place. Get with Amy, get, get on Sound Action's uh, um, uh, email list. Um, for the tanker information, the, the biggest group that's involved in this and has been for a long, long time um, is uh, Friends of the San Juans, based on San Juan Island. Um, they've got a huge amount of information available on their website. They'll be at Lobby Day. It would be, that would be a place to go and meet the people from the different organizations that are working on the different issues that you're interested in, and then plug in that way. I cannot stress, I never thought that I would be um, doing, um, making comments and meeting with people and, and um, I, I, don't, I don't like calling it lobbying because that's got such a weird um, negative uh, um, thought in some people's heads. But basically advocating for the whales by educating the people that have the power to do something about, about the situation, whatever it is, it's, if it's food or um, noise or toxins. Um, and the more you get involved, I think it's a very empowering thing to be able to um, go to your elected official and say, I'm interested in this and I want you to be interested in this too and these are the reasons why. Um, it's a slow process. Um, I've been incredibly impressed by the amount of, of movement that the public can have. Jim Waddell's here um, from Down Sense. That's an organization along with the Center for Well Research have been pushing for the Lower Snake River Dams to come down. The amount of public input has moved that dial a lot um, in ways that um, are both very frustrating because it's slow, but also very empowering. People do have a voice, they, it does matter. Your elected officials, you, are, you get to vote for them. Remind them of that. Um, and bring the science, bring, um, educate yourself and then bring um, educated comments to them. And, and it, it, it's, it, it's actually fairly interesting in a way that I never thought it would be. 
I'll be around for a while. Um, I think we're all going to chow to 